In this episode of the RV Podcast, we're going to talk about traveling with dogs, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And separation anxiety. Welcome, fellow travelers. It's time for another episode of the RV Podcast. Answering your questions, sharing tips, suggesting great trips and off-the-beaten-path adventures, and always staying on top of the RV lifestyle news you need to know about with great interviews and inside industry information. Here's your hosts, award-winning journalists Mike and Jennifer Wendland. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Wendland. This is my lifelong traveling companion and the bride of my youth. Jennifer, hello, and my dear. It's nice to be here. Yep, we're coming to you today with episode 358. And we are on Okaloosa Island, Florida. And um, we are watching what uh, is a Tropical Storm Fred coming across uh, the Gulf of Mexico, which is just out that way a little bit. We were out walking. It actually, it's, it's as we record this on a Monday afternoon... It's about four or five hours, they say, from landfall, but we, um, we think it's going to be a little bit to the east of us. We've been having fun taking videos uh, of, uh, you know, the, watching the storm clouds come in, watching the waves build, the surf come, and uh, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Right now, it's pretty calm out there. I, th- I think it's uh, passing us by. Yeah, I think. I think it's you know it's just kind of the what is it Lull saying before the storm no, be- before the storm, so it's uh, it's coming and uh, we uh, took some time getting down here. We had a, a great weekend in Nashville, Tennessee. We had a family gathering there at the Opryland Hotel. Yeah, we got everybody together except three of the grandsons, so that's not bad. Yeah, and um, we uh, couldn't take Bo with us to the hotel, so. And that is actually what has prompted uh, what we're going to talk about a little bit in the podcast, which is uh, in the interview of the week segment coming up later on, separation anxiety, and then just some of the challenges of traveling with your dog and how new places can uh, can be pretty intimidating for, for a dog, particularly in the wake of COVID. And I think separation anxiety not only applies to the dog, but it applies to the person who's gotten used to being with their dog all the time. And uh, we need a few tips on letting go. Yep. Uh, we found a terrific uh, pet sitter for Bo in Nashville, Soria. And Soria, uh, this is her full-time job. We found her through Rover.com. And we've talked about Rover before as we've traveled the country. We've used Rover for uh, daycare of, of our dog. And sometimes we have to work uh, over overnight boarding. And we've used the, with the pretty good luck, most of the places we've been, uh, rover.com. But uh, this was he- heads over uh, everything else uh, in terms of quality. Great service and just a really smart lady who knows how uh, to make your dogs have a great time uh, when uh, they're away from their humans. I wish that she lived everywhere <laughs> because I would use her a lot at home. Sometimes you'd have a wedding or a funeral or it would be comfortable to leave Bo overnight. She's just fantastic. She understands dogs. She's very professional. I couldn't have been more pleased. Yeah, she, uh, she's, she's terrific. So uh, you'll meet her a little bit later on in our uh, interview of the week segment. And uh, we'll talk uh, a little bit in our question and answer time about the challenges of traveling with the dog. And there are a number of them, and we want to be honest about that uh, for our viewers who travel with a dog, uh, looking for some tips, things like that. But, you know, speaking of dogs, we should remind everybody that they still have a few days left to win uh, the the Waggle. My uh, Waggle? My, my <laughs> Waggle. They keep changing the name. But that's the name of it. It's the Waggle is what I call it. And it's a, it's a pet monitor that works off your smartphone. You basically can tell what the temperature is inside your RV and the humidity. And then if it goes beyond certain limits, it will send you an instant alert. Uh, it all works in the cellular network. And uh, we are giving away two of them as our, you know, as we do these sweepstakes a couple times a month. Uh, we're doing one uh, that will give away a deluxe one, which is worth... Uh, two ninety nine. Two ninety nine. The one we have, which is worth one ninety nine, and we're going to give two away, and it's free. Just enter the sweepstakes by going to rvlifestyle.com slash sweepstakes. You can enter as many times as you want, 
And uh, we'll be announcing the, the winners uh, on Sunday night on our Ask Us Anything show on YouTube. And then we'll start a new sweepstakes with even cooler new prizes coming up after that. But the Waggle uh, prizes for traveling with your dog, that's just a great thing to get. Is this an appropriate time to say that they're offering half price? Oh, it is. Yeah. Uh, f- if you enter the sweepstakes, you can even, if, if you, know, you want to just get one, 50% off during the sweepstakes to uh, our listeners, to our podcast listeners and, and viewers on YouTube. Uh, we also do a YouTube version of this, a video version. Many of you have been listening to us for years on your favorite uh, podcast app, and we love having you do that. But you can also watch us too now on the RV Lifestyle YouTube channel. So video and audio, same podcast, same great stars. <laughs> Except now i got to try to look good. <laughs> It just being it takes casual. a little longer for prep, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, I actually comb my hair today. So <laughs> I, I think. Uh, hey, we uh, always like to share some of the photos that we've got. And here, one of the things that people are always talking about is uh, uh, toads. You know, what do you? How do you tow a car? What do you tow behind you? And we get some pretty weird pictures that people have found over the years. And uh, the first one we have, we call this chopper toad. I wondered if that was a helicopter. Yes, it is. it is a helicopter, and I wonder what the other thing is. It's somebody in, uh, it looks like a small Class A is towing a flatbed trailer, and they have a helicopter, a small helicopter on the back of it. i got to say, I've never seen that before. I have never seen that easier. Somebody posted that on our RV Lifestyle Facebook group. Uh, Joan Tucker actually uh, posted that, and she uh, thought that was the most interesting toad she had ever seen. <laughs> And um, I wonder, you'd have a little trouble with your campsite, having yeah. your little helicopter to take off to go buy groceries. Yeah, that's one taking way. Taking off and landing. And then uh, we found another, we got another picture this week from our Facebook group on what people tow behind their RVs. And this one is uh, was posted <laughs> also by Joan, and it is a two-story toad. So they've got their car underneath, and then it looks like, are those canoes? Well, like about four of them? i got to get it's, closer. It's a, it looks like a sports car. Uh, on a, This is a Class C. It looks, like a, it looks like a leisure travel van actually is pulling it, a Unity. Uh, it's on a flatbed trailer, and there's like a little sports car. And then above that is a pontoon boat. Oh, a Not- pontoon boat. <laughs> I said, well, I'm looking at a little two no. by three picture here. Yeah, it's a I was trying to figure out what that was. With a big outboard motor on it. So, uh, and that, I swear that's a, didn't that look like a Unity to you that's towing it? I need a magnifying glass. Yeah, that and Joan a says, small. this is what I would call glamping. I wonder how they make it under bridges and overpats, but that's just me. A two story towed. Uh, those of you who watch hey, this on land, YouTube, see, they're ready. They can do it all. And if they're buddies with the guy in the helicopter, they can go over the air. Right. So that was pretty fun. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to, to uh, share with you is uh, we heard from uh, the manager of the music production company of uh, uh, a rising country star named Taylor Ray. And uh, Taylor is... Uh, uh, has a new album out, and in that is a song that they are trying to make sort of the anthem for the um, uh, for the RV lifestyle. And uh, so the manager sent us a note and uh, a quick a little click from Taylor about the song, which is called "Home on the Road," not "Home on the Range," "Home on the Road." And it's a little story about. You know, a cross-country trip and a little van life type type of RV. And uh, we'll play a little excerpt of this song. Uh, should we do the song first and then meet Taylor? Yeah, we'll do that, right? All right. All right so here's a little excerpt of Taylor Ray's song, Home on the Road, and uh, a little uh, interview with Taylor. Home on the road 
is the second single off the album and this one is about driving back and forth across the country um, in an old black Chevy step van from the 70s. Um, no AC, it was quite treacherous. I think it only could get up to 55 miles an hour. Um, this one is fun. It's just kind of a blues rock song about being broke and being young and making memories. What do you think? I think she has a sweet voice and that's a nice little country song. Yeah, Home on the Road. Uh, you can hear that on Spotify and you can check her out. We'll put a link to uh, uh, her, uh, her music on uh, the show notes for this episode and in the uh, description below. So uh, thanks to uh, Taylor Ray for the little soundbite and a uh, little chance to hear uh, your song, Home on the Road. All right, when we come back, we've got lots of RV news for you this week. So stay with us. We'll be back after this. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10. When you buy $99 or more in merchandise, you'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. If you've visited an RV park lately, surely, besides all the RVs, you've seen these e-bikes. Jennifer and I are proud e-bike owners, and the e-bike that we chose are Rad Power Bikes, America's number one e-bike brand offering direct-to-consumer pricing on powerful premium electric bikes. Jen and I love our Rad Power Bikes. We use them to go around the campground, to explore the area we're in. I have the city bike version. Hers is the step-through model. And those are just two of a whole bunch of different models offered by Rad Power Bikes. All of them can reach 20 miles an hour with zero pedaling. But of course, you can also pedal. And you've got five different levels of pedal assist to make the going just a little bit easier and fun. You can go between 20 to 40 miles on a single charge. Now, here's the deal. You can save $75 off if you use the coupon code RV Lifestyle at checkout. Plus, of course, free shipping. Welcome back, everybody. And now it's time for the RV News of the Week. And we're starting off with some big news from Airstream. And uh, Airstream basically said that they were seriously considering dumping Mercedes-Benz Sprinter and uh, going to a different chassis for its uh, very popular Airstream um, Interstate, which I think has been the number one selling Class B van on the road for a long time. But like uh, a lot of companies, Airstream is facing those supply chain disruptions. And they can't get enough of those things. That's the only chassis that they build Class Bs on. So uh, the uh, CEO of Airstream, Bob Wheeler, announced that uh, they were uh, they were seriously thinking about uh, dumping it. I wonder how many they sell a year. Well, I don't know. Class Bs. That they, would be very interesting. How many they sell? I wonder if Mercedes Benz will take them seriously, or they'll they'll just not care because. Uh, they have Amazon buying all of theirs. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this on Ask Us Anything uh, this weekend. But, um, you know, the problem Airstream faces is the same one every Class B maker that has relied on the Sprinter chassis, very popular chassis for the van life crowd. Um, you can't get them. And uh, they, they got everybody mad at them at first because uh, Mercedes-Benz, look, let's see, RV manufacturers... Amazon and Amazon bought thousands of them, bought them all up, you know, for the delivery vans. And so the RV dealers were put behind the, uh, the Amazon orders. And that kind of, you know, didn't do real well. That made it harder to get a sprinter. And then the supply chain thing hit. 
and even uh, there were some EPA issues as well with the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency giving some, uh, there was some paperwork problems that Mercedes had and filling out emissions. And uh, that was a couple of years ago. And then now the supply issue. And the bottom line is, is it's very hard to get a Sprinter chassis. And you can't blame Airstream. I mean, if that's all that they use and they can't get any, they've just lost their Class B market. Yes, and that's the only chassis they built on. Uh, the other manufacturers, I think they recognized the handwriting on the wall a little earlier, and they got they started building some models on the, the Ram Promaster chassis, and lately the Ford Transit chassis. And that is what uh, Bob Wheeler from Airstream uh, is. Uh, he, that's what the bottom line message was, that they're, they're, they, they'll are they find something else if they can't get sprinters. And uh, the Ford Transit uh, chassis uh, is a very popular chassis. It's one we have on our vehicle, and we I like it. I mean, there's a couple things I like the Sprinter m more about, but bottom line, it's a nice chassis. It's a very nice chassis. I mean, our... Small thing is a limited space between the two seats when you have a dog. And uh, if we lived where it was real mountainous, it doesn't have quite the pickup. Yeah. But uh, yep. so the uh, so they're thinking about getting another chassis provider, probably the Ford Transit. I should tell you that the Ford Transit has also had problems with getting chips and, and turning out enough of those as well. But uh, this turmoil and this popularity of the van life movement is huge and shows no signs of easing. So the manufacturers are forced to scramble because they can't get the sprinters right now. And our next story comes from the state of Montana where two men and their dog were hiking off trail, not supposed to hike off trail. I don't think you're supposed to have a dog either when you go hiking. But anyway, they went off trail and uh, they were attacked by a, a mama grizzly at, who had a couple of cubs and they weren't hurt that badly. But um, never good to put a bear in a bad situation where they attacked a human because you never know if the bear will get put down. Yeah, and we don't know what whether these guys had bear spray with them. Oh, um, they did. They, they did. They? Yeah, well, yeah. That's good because if it's nothing you want, to, you don't want to between a mama grizzly and her cubs. And people keep thinking, well, I wasn't. I don't. I'm not going to harass the cubs. That's not the issue. If the mother bear sees you. She sees you as a threat to her cubs. Whether you're doing anything or not, you're in her territory, her space at that moment. And, uh, you know, it, it can be very dicey. So, And I think probably what they had going for them was that there were two of them. And I don't know how big their dog was. I imagine it wasn't a real tiny dog. But they had the bear spray, and they fought the bear off. Always carry bear spray. And uh, it, 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 it's more effective than a weapon. Uh, and they, that's been proven many times. Uh, you know, obviously a weapon is a little more fatal uh, solution to the problem, but uh, the bear spray really does does work. I mean, you can't blame the grizzly bear. I mean, she was where she was supposed to be with her cubs. And these people, people who go off the trail, you have to stay on the trail and you have to have bear spray and you yeah. make noise. You scare them away. And let's face it, uh, they may not have done anything more than that. Um, you know, you, when you're out there, you got to be aware of bear. So we have some more wildlife news. This comes from a three-year-old little girl. She was in uh, Cape Cod National Seashore, and she was attacked by a coyote. First of all, this little girl was not hurt bad. No, she, she wasn't hurt because somebody had a gun and they shot the coyote. And the cause is people feeding coyotes, and then coyotes lose their fear of people. And the coyotes are always looking for food. Don't feed coyotes. Don't leave your food laying around where coyotes can eat that food. Animals have to have a fear of people and so that the animals are safe and we're safe. And the coyotes are spending more and more time in populated areas, particularly in, our, in the suburbs. We live kind of far out in the suburbs. Uh, we hear them fairly regularly. And I'll tell you what, we don't let Bo, uh, we have an a electric fence in our yard, so Bo doesn't ever leave our property. But at night, when we're in our Michigan home, we don't let Bo out alone after dark because uh, of coyotes. And Bo could probably handle his own, but uh, it, with a pack, I don't know. But we have heard a lot of stories that this, these coyotes have become so familiarized with people that they literally live in your backyard. And many of them have, uh, some of them have mated with 
large breeds of dogs. And so we've heard in our part of Michigan, for example, that the coyotes there are much larger than most coyotes. Most coyotes are kind of scrawny little things, and these are pretty big. They're big, and they don't have a fear of people. We've heard of, of them taking down horses mm -hmm. in, uh, out in, in our area. This next story is uh, from Indiana Dunes National Park, which is a relatively new national park. It is. It used to be a state park. Uh, we became a national park in 2019. And, uh, and now it is so popular, people are flocking there. We tried to get in. And uh, I couldn't get in until like October. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but the reason uh, we bring this up too is like other state parks or national parks around the country, they now want to charge entry fees uh, because they're getting all these visitors. Uh, the demands on the infrastructure are strong. And so they have to figure out a way to pay for that. So they've got several different proposals, uh, different ideas on how to raise that money. One is $25 for a seven-day vehicle pass. And then they have a $15 per person fee that they want to make sure that if you walk in, you can pay. If you're bicycling in or if you're boating in, you still got to pay 15 bucks per person. And if you come in on a motorcycle, $20. Now, there could be two people, maybe three people on that motorcycle. I don't know. Money, money, money. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, and then they're looking at selling a 45-day annual pass as well. Uh, so they're uh, proposing that, and they've got to go through a bunch of hoops and regulations. But bottom line, National Park gets pretty much whatever they ask when they want it. When they bring these proposals up, they've got all the dice laid out, and they're going to get approval for it. And uh, it looks like, if not yet this year, or certainly next year, we'll see uh, – Pretty good uh, series of entrance fees. Well, then it sounds like there'll be entrance fees for all the national parks eventually. Yeah, yeah. There's only a few of them. I think Smoky Mountains is the only national park yeah, now all that's the others completely have free. Pass, so there's fees yeah. already. Yeah. I wonder why this one didn't have a fee. Well, I think because it came from a state park, and uh, I don't know what the circumstances were, hmm. but it's, it's very popular. It's a really neat park. Uh, and we have a cautionary final story for you today that... Uh, has nothing to do with uh, anybody doing anything wrong. It wasn't even an electrical storm, but uh, this one happened in Maine. It was an adult, and two children were hospitalized last week after they received an electric shock while swimming in a campground pool. In a campground swimming pool. So something wasn't wired right, and we don't know uh, what caused it. It wasn't serious uh, injuries for them, non-life-threatening, but... Uh, as of um, we time we're reporting this, they're investigating that. And it's, um, I don't know anything about this campground. It's the Cold River Campground. and But they were in the pool, and somehow they got an electrical shock there. So there's something else to worry about while you're <laughs> It wasn't life-threatening. So yep. that's a good part. Yep. And uh, bad weather. We've heard reports about bad weather around the country uh, in uh, down in Brooklyn, Michigan, and uh, southwestern Michigan, uh, there was a couple of RVs. Uh, a strong windstorm went through last week, and actually, it was overturning RVs there. So, wow! So, it is the season as we <laughs> report this. We're looking at the Gulf of Mexico and storm clouds from Tropical Storm uh, Fred. It's hard to take a storm named Fred seriously. <laughs> Fred just sounds like such a nice but name. But there's another one after we get through. Grace. Grace. Grace is coming. And that, that's another name that doesn't jive well with being a dangerous thing. But I can see the winds picking up, and all this uh, causes us to answer the question I've had from several of you who know we're down here in Okaloosa, and they said, well, are you worried about your RV in the storm? No, because we have left our RV for a few days uh, at uh, Inland, about 25 miles away from us here, and it's uh, secure in the driveway of uh, some of our friends here. It is, and I think we've needed that RV how many times since we left it? Oh, gosh. Have you, has this happened to you guys that you've ever, you, you've, you, you've maybe stayed in a hotel, or you're mooch stocking, or you're going to be house guests? Hey, how many times do you run back and forth? You get everything out of the RV that you think you need, and then you go back, and you go back, and you go back. And we thought we had taken care of fact, as I was driving the RV to leave it, uh, Jennifer was texting me. And she, don't forget this. Don't forget that. Don't forget this. And I got there, and I said, oh, I need all of this gear for the podcast. And I was bringing stuff, and we still forgot a ton. 
But the RV is safe. We're going to go pick it up this week, and we hope to, uh, to do some exploring with it and a couple of stories we want to do in the next week or so while we're down here in Florida. But uh, that's the RV. Wherever you are, it's just a reminder, the weather can change. There's tornadoes, there's floods, there's uh, wildfires. All right, that's our news of the week, and uh, we want to thank you guys uh, for um, helping us uh, be alerted to some of the stories we reported uh, this week. When we come back, the RV questions of the week as the RV podcast continues. Stay with us. Fall is just around the corner, so it's time to start thinking about prepping for the off-season. And whether you own an RV, a travel trailer, or a camper, EmpireCovers.com is here to help you protect all your vehicles against Mother Nature. EmpireCovers.com offers high-quality, affordable covers that are engineered to protect. Every cover comes with a free multi-year warranty to guarantee that it remains durable over time. If you're not in need of a full cover, Empire has just launched a line of RV rooftop covers that keep the roof of your RV clean and protected from UV rays. Listeners can receive free shipping and 60% off the original price of their cover order. Visit EmpireCovers.com slash RV Lifestyle or use the promo code RV60 at checkout. EmpireCovers.com. Protect what you love. Tired of overcrowded campgrounds? Competing for reservations? Paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is an emerging trend in RVing that might be right for you. Jennifer and I visited the Landings, a lakefront community just west of Nashville, Tennessee, that offers incredible lakefront RV properties up to 70 times the size of typical RV lots with frontage on the biggest lake in Tennessee. We loved it. The scenery is breathtaking and you own it outright. Not a timeshare, your property, your way. You can have your own private dock. You can landscape, garden. They're pet friendly. It's gated and secure with high speed internet. There's even free RV and boat storage. A wonderful place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations. It's ready whenever you want. Dockable lakefronts starting at only $59,900. There's financing and big discounts on multi-lot packages. For information, visit rvlakes.com. That's rvlakes.com. All right, welcome back, everybody. This is the RV Questions of the Week. And before we get into the questions, we want to remind you that we'd love to get your questions. The best way to do that is to send those questions by video. Just use your smartphone and uh, like you do a selfie, just hit video, ask us your question, and then email them to us, just like Brad Olson did this week. So let's see what his question is. Hi, Mike and Jen. This is Brad Olson from Central Minnesota. Recently, I watched a video you had produced on the importance of exercising your generator once a month. My question is, can a person run your generator while you're en route to a new location? And also, would it be a good idea to run your air conditioner while you're exercising your generator? Thanks again for all you do, and God bless. Were those Rad Power bikes that uh, Brad had? Yes, yes. As it looked like the city bike version that you and I have, same version. He uh, said uh, when he sent that uh, in that he had just done a 34-mile bike ride with his uh, Rad Power e-bike. So a lot of RVers are using them. Uh, but to your question, Brad, about using a generator when you go down the road, the answer is? Yes. Absolutely you can. It doesn't hurt a in. thing. Yeah. If it's built in. Oh, Good point. It has to be built in because if it is portable, there's no guarantee that you have the right uh, exhausting system, the right ventilation for it. Uh, I know a lot of DIYers say, I can build it better than a manufacturer. Maybe you can. So I won't talk to you. But generally, the rest of you uh, don't run a portable one while you're running down the road. But and I don't know how you would do that anyway. Uh, but uh, if it's a built-in permanent uh, generator... No problem. We do it. Uh, and one of the reasons most people do that is so that they uh, can run the air conditioner as they're going down the road. The air conditioner to cool off the RV part of, uh, of a motorhome uh, while you might have the, the uh, cab dash from the engine uh, air conditioner on up front. The back can get pretty hot. I mean, we had temperatures over 100 degrees. We had 106 degrees at one point when we were driving south. Yeah, this past week. So... 
Uh, if somebody had been in the back uh, area, we would have certainly wanted to have the air conditioner on back there. And the only way to do that when you're going down the road is to turn on the generator. So it doesn't hurt it at all. Uh, okay, question time uh, from our Ask Us Anything. We do this Ask Us Anything program. If you've never tuned into it, it's every Sunday night, 7 o'clock Eastern time on our RV Lifestyle YouTube channel and also simulcast on our RV Lifestyle Facebook page and RV Lifestyle Facebook group at 7 o'clock. And we do nothing but answer your questions for a full hour. So we um, collect a lot of questions from there. And uh, in keeping with the theme of this week's episode, uh, we had a question about traveling with dogs. And uh, uh, we share some pretty candid uh, answers about the challenges of traveling with a dog as we answer this question from Ask Us Anything. How difficult is it to travel with a dog in a Class B? Depends and, on how big the dog is. And a Class C. Um, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult for us. <laughs> Not that our dog, Bo, is any more difficult. It's just that uh, it restricts what you can do. Well, I, th I think because we have a bunch of other lives Media, but he's 72 pounds. He doesn't like traveling in the RV. He doesn't like the bombs. And he, stuff. He's very scared. It, and I don't want to medicate him all the time. No, we're not going to medicate our dog. And uh, he's very hairy. So he there's a lot of hair. Yeah. But, but I, we love him. Oh, yeah. We you know we have to go to a family thing in Nashville in, a, in two weeks. And honest, we want to cancel it because we don't. Our kids we might be listening. Well, then, <clears throat> then one of them should step up and watch our dog. Well, they're coming with us. Oh well, then I don't know what we're going to do because, <laughs> you know, we can't bring him. It's a, it's a two days thing in a in in the Opryland Hotel in Nashville, and we can't bring the dog there, so we have to get him boarded could, someplace. Uh, and I don't want to do put that. Put a bonnet on him or something. Put a bonnet on him. Tell me he's an ugly kid. Yeah. I don't know, but but ba Babu, it is. That's a great name, by the way. It is it is difficult to travel with the dog because in our case we work you know we're always we don't we don't just travel just to have a good time we have a good time and work as we're having a good time so we're always shooting videos uh, oftentimes we both have a camera in our hands and then we have to think about the dog all the time so we're not allowed to bring our e-bikes as many times as we'd like because we can't go off on a long bike ride and what do we do with the dog and uh, hiking, we love to hike. We have to take relatively short hikes because what do you do about the dog? And dogs aren't welcome on all trails. And yeah, and national parks are really not welcome at all. At all. Um, we have an app on our phone. We have a great device called Waggle. Hint, hint. Stay tuned next week about our next sweepstakes, which allows us. It's an internet connection you purchase for a year, and then this device will send you a. Um, send you temperature inside your RV. And that is really a, a handy thing to have. For example, let me see if I can pull up mine right now. It depends on what you want to do, whether you want to hit a bunch of tourist spots. And in some states, you can't leave your dog alone in the vehicle. Where there's a will, there's a way. You can find Rover. You can put your dog in doggy daycare or with a vet. So you can go do something for a few hours. So that is our RV right now. Inside the RV, it is 76.41 degrees. And uh, that is just a really nice thing. If you can see uh, over here, I've got red. Uh, and if it goes, if the green goes to the red, that means it's getting close to too hot and it'll send me a text alert so that we can always be sure of how safe and, and warm and, and hot or cold it is in the RV. Waggle is the name of that app. But still, we don't go you know, for very long without Bo. And um, it's, it's a hassle. It is and a, we were so comfortable with Rover, and then we had a bad experience. We had a really bad experience with the Rover, yeah. And so that wasn't good, and it made us a little gun shy. And then also at a doggy daycare, he, uh, he became afraid of women with long hair yeah, carrying big purse. Happened something happened to him. Elk hounds are very sensitive. He might be a big boy, 72 pounds. He's a big baby. And, yeah, but he's a big baby. And, you know, he's our dog. And, and little dogs are obviously easier to travel with. Mm -hmm. And then if you're not, if you are not real active, then it's probably a lot easier. Right. But if you like to 
go for long hikes, if you like to explore, if you like to eat out, all things that we like to do, uh, you always have to consider the dog. Well, we did just get back from Nashville and we had Bo with us. We couldn't take him to the hotel that we stayed at and we found a great sitter on uh, rover.com and uh, you're going to meet her coming up in just a second or so here on our interview of the week. But uh, uh, just always remember, uh, there with, with every benefit of traveling with the dog comes some challenges too, right? Yes, and uh, I wish all of our experiences were as good as what we had last week. All right, so you will meet our pet sitter, and she's going to share a couple of really interesting things with you and also offer some great tips about making sure your dog, your dog enjoys his time uh, away from you when you have to leave him for a while and uh, that your dog uh, also travels well. So uh, stay tuned. You'll meet our dog sitter uh, coming up in the interview of the week in just a moment. You're now looking at one of the most amazing solutions we've found for helping find great campsites just like Google Street View, but for campgrounds. We can now go and virtually tour campgrounds across the country thanks to campgroundviews.com. They are directly integrated with recreation.gov and allow you to pick your dates and click on and pick sites that are available. You can then reserve your site directly from recreation.gov with confidence that the site is just what you want it to be. It's a game changer for all of us campers seeking great camping sites. I've been finding amazing camping sites all across the country using this tool, and it's live right now for members to use. Go to campgroundviews.com, get access to the solution, and watch and experience as they bring hundreds more of these locations online for us to tour. This is revolutionary technology at your fingertips right now. Go to campgroundviews.com, check out the brand new campground virtual tours, and finally, look where you're going. All RVers need specialized emergency transportation coverage to cover air and ground ambulances, return to home services, and vehicle return. You only have a 68% chance that those services will be completely covered by your major medical. The sad reality is that a lot of people believe they have that coverage, but it turns out most carriers that claim to cover air ambulances only cover you for a hospital-to-hospital -hospital transfer and offer no coverage to get you to the initial hospital in the first place. The truth is 68% of air ambulances are hospital-to-hospital. -hospital. Here's a map of all the places in the U.S., that getting to the hospital in the golden hour is not possible without an air ambulance. And with an average cost of $52,481 for an air ambulance, why would you take the risk? Go to peaceofmindforrvs.com today and take a look at the true emergency transportation coverage they offer that covers it all. The coverage can save your life and your life savings. Check it out, peaceofmindforrvs.com. Jennifer and I are members, and we urge you to consider it too. Peace of mind for RVs.com. Welcome back, everybody. Time now for the interview of the week. Just like so many of you, we have Bo, we have a pet, and we love taking our dog and letting him have new life experiences as well. But when you're out on the road, you do run into times where you can't take your dog and you need to find a place that your dog will be safe and well cared for and, if possible, loved on. And we've been using a service now for a couple of years called Rover.com. It's kind of like an Airbnb for dogs. Basically, um, you can do pet uh, daycare or you can do in-home uh, care boarding of your dogs. And a lot of the Rover uh, pet sitters will even come to your place and pick up your pet and drop them off when you'd like at a certain time. So what a luxury to have somebody come, you're in a strange area, you don't know your way around, pay them some extra, have them pick up your pet, keep your pet overnight or just for the day, and then even bring them back. We did that, I believe, in New Orleans. Yes, and, we did. Uh, the sitter was another, it was Laura, a friend of ours named Laura and her dog and our dog, Bo. The, the rover sitter drove to the campground, picked both dogs up, took her to her house. They played them with them all day and then brought them back at night while we went out and toured New Orleans. Well, this uh, sitter that we met this last uh, trip was in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, we had a, a family a gathering at a hotel that was a lot of fun, but obviously couldn't bring Bo. But as we were talking with her, we realized that uh, all dogs and, and many of their owners as well, pet parents, as she calls them, <laughs> uh, 
have been going through a really stressful time because of COVID. And she has some pretty startling uh, statistics about how many dogs experience separation anxiety. Dogs and their parents. You had trouble too, right? Didn't want to leave Bo. I did too, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, Bo had a great time. He did have, he was so tired. Her name is uh, Soroya Coy. And uh, this is her full-time job, taking care of dogs. And uh, she, as we picked Bo up uh, the other day, we got her to uh, spend a little bit of time with us and offer some great advice and tips for all of us who travel with our pets. Uh, but be sure to listen to this first stuff she talks about. Which she talks about separation anxiety because so many of us have been together with our pets 24-7 for the past, you know, 18 months. Meet our uh, interview of the week, Soroya Coy. So here we are picking up Bo. This is Soria. We found Soria through, through Rover, mm -hmm. which we use all of the time. And uh, while we were in Nashville, Bo had a great time. Thank you for sending us all those pictures. Oh, you're so very welcome. I'm so glad he had a great time. He had a great time. Yeah. And you made us feel really good. We felt very comfortable leaving him. And I can tell, I could tell from the pictures that he was having fun. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we just came to get him and I'm not sure he wants to leave. <laughs> you know what? That's typically how it is when they're here. They just make so many new friends and they have so many positive interactions. And all of a sudden, when you come to pick up, it's like they're leaving their version of Disneyland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go went to camp. So what we wanted to talk about was uh, the whole changing dynamics that COVID meant for so many pet owners. Right. Uh, and separation anxiety. And as more and more RVers are going to be traveling now and uh, they leave their pets with them, uh, they're experiencing that as their pets are. Are you seeing that? And what advice would you give folks about it? Yes, absolutely. I'm seeing it in, I would say, probably 80% of the dogs that I work with, which is a significant amount considering I take care of hundreds of dogs a year, uh, especially now with the pandemic being, well, it's still going on, but now we're in 2021. Most of my clients have been working from home for the last year, and so their dogs have become very accustomed to a certain lifestyle. Having their owners around 24-7, um, it's a very comfortable lifestyle. However, uh, when their parents are going back to work and having to kind of adjust their daily schedules, it's a lot harder for the dogs to adapt. Uh, one thing that I would definitely recommend is establishing a routine, getting your dog used to having some separation from you, even if you are still working from home. And that way, when that transition does happen full time, it's a lot easier for you and for their dog. Now, RVers, of course, are in a different place all the time and they're out traveling again with their pets. Uh, when they uh, leave them with a rover sitter or maybe even alone with the air conditioning on in the RV, uh, how do you recognize separation anxiety in a pet? There are a lot of behavioral symptoms and signs that your dog will exhibit when they're nervous. One of, it, uh, one of the symptoms is excessive panting. Uh, even if they're not exerting themselves excessively with physical activity, just standing there and panting, whining, looking to you constantly, uh, basically any demands for attention or affection, those are pretty big markers for separation anxiety. Barking, uh, anything, like I said, anything to get your attention, clawing at you. So once you start to see those symptoms or those signs, the number one thing that you should be doing is to ignore your dog when they're exhibiting those signs. Most parents, they're very maternal and paternal and they just wanna calm their dogs down when their dogs are uncomfortable and anxious but all we do is we validate that behavior. So if we act neutral and ignore them, eventually they'll start to learn that my anxiety is not being validated. Nothing, you know, nothing is a big deal. So I'm not going to act like it's a big deal because my parents are pretty neutral. And uh, if obviously if they start to pick up some anxious energy from you because there is something going on, then it's hard to, to be neutral and to calm them down in those moments. Now, if you're sensing any anxiety in both, that's because there are squirrels <laughs> there in are the background. Lots and of those squirrels. are okay, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think this is kind of like even dropping your child off at school. Yes. And they sense that you're nervous, mm -hmm. then they get apprehensive. But if you're happy and, hey, I'm going to be back, you yeah. know, and everything like Bo knows, we'll be right back. Absolutely. What? You're leaving me again? <laughs> if we act like it's such a devastating thing to leave them, they're going to feel like it's devastating. And mm -hmm. every single time 
they anticipate you leaving or you do actually leave, it is the end of their world. Especially when we come home and we kind of make it a parade and a huge celebration every single time we come home, they start to attribute that to, well, if it's such a big deal when they come home, it's a big deal when they leave. If we're just neutral coming and going to them, it's just, they'll, they'll be back when they'll be back. They always come back. Um, it's not, you know, One thing I huge... noticed <laughs> when we uh, right. dropped off Bo, uh, he, we, were, we were saying, well, maybe you should take him out and back and we'll sneak out. And he said, no, 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 he has to see you leave. Yes. And, and maybe you could explain that to folks, why that's important. It's important for me to have the dog see their parents physically leaving out the front door. If I were to just take him from you while you're still in the home, in his mind, he never saw you, he never saw you leave. And he will continue to go look for you in the home. And it takes a lot longer for them to get acclimated to the environment if they still believe you're still in the home. If they physically see you leave, get in the car and go, all of a sudden, that's already removed from their mind. Well, my parents have gone. I just have to move on with my day. And, and from there, it's time to meet some new friends, time to see what Saria has in store for me today. Yeah. And, and that typically helps uh, get them settled in a lot quicker. I wanted to touch this base once before we end about uh, choosing uh, someone to watch your dog. Yes. And uh, we had several conversations by email and text before, and then you basically interviewed us uh, putting the shoe on the other end to our viewers who are going to are looking for a place to have their dog watched for a few days or even for a day, what what advice would you give them? What do they look for when they when they choose someone to take care of their pet? Absolutely, I would definitely say there are a few main questions you absolutely should be asking the person you're going to have care for your pet. One of the big questions is, well, what's your experience look like, and how relevant is that experience? to what we're asking of you to do for our pet. Secondly, asking if this is a full-time job for you or if this is a, a side gig or a hobby, which it is for a lot of people. A lot of people don't realize that when they're hiring people to take care of their pets, a lot of these people have full-time jobs. So they will be leaving for eight to nine hours a day, even though you don't know that. And knowing that ahead of time, well, you know, set not only you up for success, but for example, Bo up for success. We don't want Bo sitting alone in a home for nine or 10 hours when we've agreed to have somebody care for him all day long. And I would say the third question is asking the volume uh, that, that these sitters are taking. I personally know several sitters here in Nashville that take between 20 and 40 dogs. No, regularly. Really? That is absolutely not something that I do or ever do, only because uh, it's just not necessary to have that many dogs in a single residential home. I do offer boarding and daycare privately. However, when you have that many dogs and you are sharing the load with either just one person, which is typically a spouse, you can't give 20 to 40 dogs that much individual attention. and. Uh, and also, it's, it's, a, it's just a little too much for, in my opinion. I've done this professionally for 10 years now, and I only take a maximum of 10 dogs at a time. And even when I'm taking that many dogs, not all dogs are interacting at the same time at any, at any point during their stay. But just to keep things manageable, obviously keeping your pets safe is a big, is a big one. <laughs> and even like feeding them. Yes. Bo is a good eater. I mean, his food's yes. gone in two seconds. Right. But if there were a whole bunch of dishes lined up and some dogs didn't finish their food, he would eat everything. Absolutely. I separate all of the dogs for each meal time and each snack time. The only time dogs are together for any sort of food interaction is if I'm doing group training and they're getting a small tree. But again, I have to make sure that the dogs can actually handle that and I don't have any dogs with me that are resource guarders. Last thing we want is to avoid an incident. So I try to interview at length before caring for a pet just to make sure, we're again, we're setting everybody up for success and keeping everybody safe. Well, we want to thank you for taking such great care of our dog, Bo. <laughs> you're very and welcome. And we will be back. And we'll Bo, <laughs> yeah. you'll be back, Bo. Yes, you're coming. Right? I had one question that I had. Mm -hmm. Your background. Yes. And how you, how you got started, why you have such a love of dogs and your background. Yes. Uh, well, you know, I have a classic story that a lot of people in this industry have. I grew up always loving dogs. We had a family German Shepherd growing up, and I had grown up training him 
making obstacle courses for him in our backyard, grooming him, and uh, the few times that he would go to the vet with an ear infection or he broke his toe once, my parents, you know, would take care of him, but I would, I would take the, the brunt of that responsibility of just nurturing him throughout his entire life. And that passion really fueled me into wanting to enter a career working for animals. So I got my degree, uh, back my Bachelor of Science in Veterinary Science, worked as a vet tech for five years, worked as a groomer, really just loved every part of this industry and I wanted to get into training and, and all of a sudden ten, 10 years later I'm doing all of it <laughs> and I love it and, and that's why I, I offer so many different services is because it's just hard for me to pick one when I know I love doing so many different things. Well I feel I'm so grateful <laughs> that you entered this field and that we found you. This is just so exciting so if anybody's in the Nashville area here we go. Yes. <laughs> so Maria. thank, oh, thank you. So uh, I, I have to throw in too that you're just <laughs> wonderful. You will pick up, drop off dogs. So mm -hmm. people that are maybe KOA or whatever camping and they want to go to Upper Land, you'll come pick up their pets. Absolutely. So we don't want to give too much of her big time away because we want to make sure she has room for us when we yeah, come back. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, squeeze Bo in, please. Absolutely. <laughs> Just a little plug for Rover. It's really, uh, we've used it all over the country. Right. Um, but I have to say, of all the ones we've used, you are the best. Oh my yeah. goodness. You are the best. Thank you, the best. you so, so much. Well, so thank you. Thank you and thank Rover for putting us in contact oh, with you. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's fantastic. That's so sweet to hear. <laughs> Saroya was a gem of a person. We uh, enjoyed her. She was so professional, and uh, Bo was so well cared for. Yeah, he was. Um, but uh, great advice for all of us as we travel with our dogs. All right, hey, when we come back, it's time for our weekly Hidden Campground Gem. And this one is on the East Coast, and uh, you're going to want to learn about this campground when we come back after this. Have you had it with overbooked, overcrowded campgrounds? Then check out Harvest Hosts, where RVers can overnight for free at more than 2,400 wineries, farms, microbreweries, golf courses, and attractions. Harvest Host is a membership service for those with self-contained RVs looking for unique, beautiful, and peaceful overnight camping experiences across North America. When you become a member of Harvest Host, you can camp for free at all these places. Jennifer and I are Harvest Host members, and we've made so many great memories at Harvest Host locations. There's no charge for camping, and your Harvest Host membership fee is easily made up with just a couple of stays. Plus, you have awesome places to stay. If you use our special affiliate link of rvlifestyle.com slash HH, you'll automatically get 15% off the cost of your membership. That's 15% off, but you must use the special link, rvlifestyle.com slash HH. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And they'll probably be the same on your rig, too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back, everybody. This is our Hidden Campground Gems segment. Uh, and, uh, we've got a great one this week. I can't wait to see what Mark Kep has for us this week. And he's taking us out east. Good. Thank you, Mike and Jen, and hello, everybody. In today's edition of Hidden Gem Campgrounds, we're going to take you to the east coast of the United States and to a location that is truly a hidden gem because most most everybody doesn't even know it exists. So I'm on our big map here and I'm going to zoom in. The location is north of Wilmington and it is along the coastline but in a location that's 
inland from the beach. It's actually along the New River in a town called Sneeds Ferry. Now, unless you were in the Marines, you do not know where this is at. But if you were in the Marines, you may actually have some memories of this location because there is Camp Lejeune, which is a giant Marine base, right across the bridge from our hidden gem of the week. And that hidden gem is a campground, it's actually an RV park, called Sea Haven Marine RV Park. The location does not look fancy on the surface until you get into the, the guts of the situation. And that is that they sit on a brackish, oops, I got some sound here. They, they sit on a brackish uh, protrusion off the New River that allows you boat access to both the intercoastal and the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, um, the owners of this park, Callan Arena, just recently caught a giant uh, tuna fish out in the waters there off of their boat. So it's a great spot if you're into the waters, the ocean, and a location that is very, very scenic and quiet. They have a wonderful video. You're seeing that one here. Um, this video shows you the campground and or the RV park itself. A little interesting thing that makes this RV park very unique is the owners themselves. So these are working professionals. In fact, the owner arena is the real-time interpreter for NASA. She talks to the space station from this RV park. So the space station will actually, she'll chime in and she interprets Russian to English and English to Russian for the cosmonauts on the International Space Station. So a very unique location, a definite hidden gem. And if you're looking for, you know, one of the reasons we all go RV camping to find places like this, Sea Haven Marine RV Park, Sneeds Ferry, North Carolina, is our hidden gem of the week. It's right next to Topsail Beach. There's all sorts of fun here. Great hidden gem. Hope you all like it. Back to you, Mike. Jen oh, yeah, we'll put a link down below so you can go check out this location and see if it's the right spot for you if you're in the region. Tell them uh, we sent you from Hidden Gems and from RV Lifestyle. Back to you, Mike. Jen. That was Mark Kapp of CampgroundViews.com. Uh, just some great technology that allows you to actually see where you're going to stay and uh, to check out those campsites. And uh, that is an awesome one. If you want to uh, check it out, we'll put a link in the description below and you can uh, you can find uh, uh, where you want to go and how to get to that. You can actually look at that specific campground uh, or find your own. Um, and you can learn all about campgroundviews.com uh, who uh, generously provide us those, uh, those hidden campground gems every week. Thanks, Mark, for that report. Uh, all right, now it's time for you know what? The Burkitts. The Burkitts and Off the Beaten Path. Uh, Tom and Patty Burkett appear every week in the, uh, on uh, the RVLifestyle.com travel blog as well as our RV Lifestyle podcasts. This was once the county poorhouse, and it was big. Three floors, and each one a warren of rooms that might ha at one time have been work rooms or sitting rooms. I followed the sound of voices and eventually ended up on a glassed-in front porch where two women sat visiting with each other. The truth was I'd read a story about a macabre domestic dispute that ended with someone's fingers being chopped off and heard they were on display here. When I confessed to my gruesome fascination, they both looked disappointed. Those fingers are the only thing anyone ever hears about. There's a lot more here to learn. And as you might suspect, she was right. The real story here was the poorhouse itself and its outbuildings, and the story of public support in the USA in the years following the Civil War. You know those fingers used to be in a case in the hallway of the county courthouse and every year the third graders would go on a field trip to see them. I'm sure everyone who grew up in Wood County has seen them. All the museum puts on display about the story is contained in one tall case. In 1881, Carl Bach, a farmer, murdered his pregnant wife, mother of their three children, and dismembered her body. The next day, he walked into the local police station and gave himself up. The only physical evidence offered up at the trial were three severed fingers, and that was enough to convict him. That's how the fingers, in formaldehyde, ended up in the courthouse. He was eventually hanged for the crime, the last such execution in the county. Tickets were sold to the event. In that single case, you can see the tickets, the noose, contemporary stories about the event, and of course, the fingers. There's been a lot of talk at the museum about whether or not it's okay to put such things on display, and the two ladies I talked to disagreed about it. But at least for now, you can still have a look at this sad and strange bit of history out here off the beaten path. 
Well, that wraps up another adventure with the Burkitts. And uh, I always love what they do. And I can't wait every week to find out where we're going. And that also wraps up this edition of the RV Podcast. Again, we want to hear from you. We want you to be a part of this podcast as well. So take your cell phone, shoot a little selfie photo of yourself video, hit record, send us your comments, your questions, and uh, be a part of the uh, RV Lifestyle Podcast. Uh, new podcasts every single Wednesday. You can watch us on YouTube or you can listen to it on your favorite podcast app or through rvlifestyle.com. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this episode. Happy trails.